Have you been here all day? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, totally good. Yeah. 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 No, no. Uh, yesterday and today. Uh, Why don't you? I can do it if you want. Uh, you really? <laughs> well, how'd you say his name? Saigo. Aaron Saigo. And what about Saigo? Yeah. Uh, plasma active and device spectrum and task orientated. Semantic I'm just going to say that. Aaron Saigo. Saigo. Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, committee stage. Uh, next up we've got Aaron Saigo. Uh, he's a Canadian software developer at KDE. Yay. So afternoon is always a difficult time to uh, do these presentations. People tend to get a little bit tired and whatnot, but hopefully I'll keep you moderately entertained as we go forward. Everyone can hear me okay out there? Yes? Good. All right. So I made the cardinal sin of not asking before I came what the audience would be like. Um, so maybe you could just let me know, how many of you are software developers? How many of you are aspiring to be software developers? How many of you are just interested in technology and the intersection with... You can't raise your hand for every single one. <laughs> okay, maybe you can. So uh, we're going to be talking about free software, free as in freedom, not free as in no cost. Uh, software for the mobile era. And in particular, we're going to be talking about a uh, project that I've been working with for a number of years now uh, called Plasma Active. In fact, just yesterday, um, we made re the release of Plasma Active 4. So it's a continuing project, and we'll see what it's about, why we're doing it, um, and hopefully stir some, some questions within you as to uh, the future of, of mobile software. So. My background, really, really quick. Um, I've been r in the software industry since 1992, late 1992. I've been in it for a while now. Uh, and in 1998, I decided I wanted to move everything I was doing to Linux and free software. Uh, I felt it was the only way I could really do what I wanted to do in a fulfilling and ethical way. And I made this big, great leap. And I've been kind of doing that ever since. Uh, I wasn't originally working on desktop software or end-user software. I was much more interested in server-side stuff. And around 2000, 2001, uh, a number of things occurred all at once that made me focus on, on end-user software. I've been doing that ever since. Um, the person who introduced me mentioned KDE. Who here does not know what KDE is or who they are? Everyone knows what K who KDE is? Wow. Brilliant. I'll skip over that. Um, I've been with them, uh, working with KDE since about 2002. Um, I'm a past president of their global nonprofit uh, based in Germany. Um, so that's kind of my background in a nutshell. Let's move on to more interesting things. So uh, we decided to take on the topic as a development team of free software for the mobile era, mobile devices, phones, tablets, and consumer electronics in general. And one may ask, why? Why would we do this? I mean, we live in the era of iOS, Android. I mean, don't they do everything? Someone shook their head no, and I would agree. But a lot of people fi figure, well, you know, we got two solutions. That's, uh, what more do we really need? Um, and of course, you also have all the other RANs, BlackBerry, recently Windows Phone, etc. Well, 
there was a very interesting research project uh, that was uh, finally published through findings in July of 2011. It was by Vision Mobile, and they did it on behalf of, or for Webinos, which is a EU-funded project. And they asked, how open are different kinds of projects out there that are licensed under a free software license, such as the GPL? And they measured it using four metrics. Access, which basically was, if you are a developer or a user or someone creating a device or wanting to use a software in some fashion, could you get access to the source code, the repositories, these kinds of things? How open was development? Could you get involved? Could you send a patch? Could you see what the development roadmap was? Could you make derivatives? How easy was that? Or was it really painful to do? What was the community like? Was there a community at all? Did they support the community? Did they have open governance in the community, or was the community a second or third class citizen? And they tried to measure all of these things. Now, they didn't actually include iOS in their study because it's not an, you know, a free software or open source project. And so we all know that iOS is 0% open. Unless you're Apple, you don't get to use it. Unless you're Apple, you can't hack on it. Really, you can't do anything except play in their little walled garden as an app developer. Interestingly enough, of all the free software projects that they studied, ranging from WebKit to Qt to um, Eclipse to the Linux kernel itself, Android, arguably one of the most successful free software projects in the world, came out dead last. 23% 23, 23 is a really strange number. They're like extremely precise. I'm not sure what 23% open means to the decimal point, but what they did show was that it's not very open. It was very hard to get involved, very hard to create and maintain derivatives unless you're one of the chosen cliques, such as Samsung. It really wasn't an open project. And we figured that is not good enough. Software permeates, pervades our society. It's our ticket to participation within everything from these days medical to politics to just chatting with your friends. It is becoming the way we transact and transmit money, information, thoughts, and ideas. And if we live in a world where the mobile OS and mobile stacks are all closed and non-participatory, that's cool. Um, this has huge ramifications for society, negative ones. We envision a world where all technology is open, where people can participate in their terms, in their way, but it still needs to be quality software. And the question, of course, is, is this possible? We do live in the world of a dominant iOS and a dominant Android, actually Android being the dominant one now, which is really cool um, from a free software perspective. But is it possible to create some third entry, or in this case, fifth or sixth entry, really, into the market and have a meaningful impact? That's a really good question. And, it may, and to a lot of the people on our team, we started this project two, two years ago or so, uh, at least the Plasma Active side of it. We had to really you know, take on this question. Um, and so before anyone asks, like, so when I started doing these presentations, the first question people would often ask at the end is like, OK, come on, is this real? I mean, you're, is this a hobby project, or do you really expect it to do real things in the real world? And the way I kind of see things is, you know, for as long as there's been people on this earth looking up to the sky, we've seen the moon, we've wanted to touch it. And that's what, that's what humans are like. We see absurd goals, and we go, yep, I'm going to be there one day. And even though it took us thousands of years, we kept reaching upwards until we finally did touch the moon. To me, this is our moonshot project for me and my team and those who are participating. But we do believe it is possible. We didn't, however, want to simply set out and recreate something that looked, behaved, followed the same paradigms of Android or iOS. We feel and we believe that if you just simply go into the market with the same thing everyone else has already done, it's really hard to convince people to look at what you're doing and take advantage of it. So here's how we see the world and our vision of mobile. We don't see phones and tablets and laptops and desktops and set-top boxes. 
we see a continuum of devices, one that bleeds into the other, kind of like this rainbow of colors. The Linux kernel did something really interesting, for which I think there's a parallel here. Before the Linux kernel, uh, when you were de developing an embedded device, you often developed it from the ground up. If you're going to be running a supercomputer, you would use an OS designed for a supercomputer. We had desktop OSs, we had server OSs, didn't have tablet OSs so much of the time, unless you count maybe the Newton. Uh, and if you're making a phone, you definitely made everything from the, the ground up. The Linux kernel people were crazy people. And they looked at it and went, wait a minute, they all have networking, I.O., they maybe throw something onto a screen, perhaps. Uh, you know, this is yeah, disk, RAM, blah, blah. These are all computers. How about we make one kernel, make it really modifiable, make it tunable, and instead of having all these different OSs, let's have one kernel and just make it run in everything from a watch to a supercomputer. This is absurd, in theory, at the time. And yet, we live in a time when Linux runs on smartwatches, all the way to powering over 95% of the world's largest supercomputers. One kernel. We look at that and go, that's a great model, and we're bringing it to the user interface realm. We see all of these different ways of interacting as people with our machines as being a continuum. What is the difference between a phone and a tablet, a laptop, or any other device that we interact with as, as end users? Well, what do we use them for? We use them to communicate. We use them to look at websites. We use them to create content. Generally, we're doing the same things on all of our devices, with some being better at, at some things and others being better at different things. But it's a continuum. We no longer have these stark contrasts. You know, your phone is not really so much a phone anymore, is it? It's a game machine slash Twitter feed slash, oh yeah, I also make phone calls with it occasionally. Uh, and we see this as being how things are going to progress into the future. So about five years ago, maybe six now, eh, I started a project called Plasma. And we originally started writing a desktop interface. And this is what it looks like today, more or less. It looks fairly standard, nothing too spectacular or you know, mind-bogglingly different. There are some interesting new concepts in it. I won't bore you with them right now, because it's not really the point of this presentation. But while designing it, we decided to, or me and a few friends, they were working on it at the time, we decided to approach it from a very different perspective. We wanted to create a UI or user experience that could be reshaped, remolded, and refitted to different kinds of experiences. The first one we did after desktop was Netbook. This is the time when Netbooks were really popular and were coming out, and they looked promising before they became basically really tiny laptops. They were originally really low uh, specs, very long battery life machines. Problem was they had these horribly little small screens and they really asked for a different way of using them. And the idea was people would use them for mostly online, you know, checking your, say, your news, your weather, et cetera. So taking the same code base that we used for Plasma Desktop, without any really significant changes, we were able to create a completely different way of interacting with a different sort of device, although similar to a, a laptop or desktop, and that was the netbook. Since then, we've come a long ways. And we have things as diverse as Plasma Media Center, which, well, you probably can guess what it does. Um, plays videos, lets you view your, uh, your photo albums, either locally or on Picasa or Flickr, wherever you store them. But we decided to go one step further and really realize that full vision of Spectrum UX. And we started Plasma Active with the first focus being on tablet devices. Things that were you know, between 5-inch to 10-inch screen size, completely driven by touch, and really focused on mobile usage, which means you're going to turn them on, use them for a while, sleep them, throw them in your backpack, chuck it around. This is a completely different way of interacting with the machine than the desktop. And the question was, could we bridge that gap, or would we have to start from scratch? The theory was we could just take what we had, remodel it a bit, and without significant difference, have a touch-centric UI that worked as you would expect in a touch-based device such as a tablet or a phone. The code base difference between the tablet UX and the desktop UX, 
not counting the, you know, the kernel, the user space, libraries like Qt, et cetera, that we use, just the application code we wrote around Plasma as a framework, the difference between desktop and tablet is less than 5% by, by uh, lines of code. And that's not something that happens by accident. So in this uh, screenshot, you'll see in the top left, we have a battery indicator, uh, network indicator, et cetera, you know, stuff you expect. What's interesting is these are the exact same components that we use on the desktop, or for that matter, in the media center. These things have batteries. They have network. Why would you recreate these same things over and over and over again? Yet we see this happen with uh, modern mobile OSs, where they have their own complete framework for showing a battery icon or a, a network icon. Instead, we reuse these between the different form factors. And when we get to the point, I can see some people with a kind of look on their face like, wait a minute, how does that work? I'll show you in a bit. So with the tablet UI, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to look at the mobile space and not bring the same concepts that we see in uh, Android or iOS. We sat back and looked at what they're doing and we call them application buckets, right? You buy a device, it really doesn't do a lot, probably comes with a bunch of crapware from the vendor who put it on, especially with Samsung, they love doing that. And the first thing you do is you download all your favorite apps, and then basically it's an app launcher from that point forward. And you run one app at a time, more or less, and that's what it is. If you didn't have apps on it, if you didn't have an app store, it'd be almost useless. It would become a phone again, right? You could text people and, and phone people. But what else could you do? Instead of creating yet another application bucket, we decided to create a UX or user experience that would be focused on tasks. We looked at it when people use their devices to do things, right? To catch up with social media, create content, consume content, look at websites, play a game. But when it comes to putting that same kind of device into a productivity environment, such as an office, or a school classroom, it gets clumsy. So we identified this idea of activities. And I'll explain them to you now. And as I explain them to you, keep in mind that we use the same concept on the desktop and the other form factors as well. So what an activity is, is it allows you to say, I am doing fill in the blank. Maybe I'm planning my vacation or setting up you know, next week's amazing bash at my house, or I'm studying for my physics exam, or this is my uh, work for this client that I'm working with. On the right side, this little thing that comes out actually zips back. It's a little carousel. And you can switch between, you can see there's one at the bottom, vacation, welcome, new activity. You can switch between them just using your, your thumb or finger. And when you switch activities, it changes what the device is focused on. Um, in this case, I'm configuring activity, giving it a name, trip to Berlin. You can set a wallpaper. Once you've given it a name, you can then collect everything to do with it. So often when I'm coming to a place like here, I will add maps, uh, notes about my hotel, because I'm really good at getting lost, as it turns out, um, contact information, presentation materials, everything to do with this visit that I'm doing right now. Of course, when I'm home, I don't care about being here. So I'm not using that activity. I'm using my, maybe my home activity or whatever uh, work project I'm working on. The London campus party activity is sitting off to the side just waiting for me to be interested in it. And as soon as I switch to that activity, suddenly that device is showing me everything to do with being here in London for a campus party. So you can associate applications, bookmarks, widgets with information such as yeah, news, weather, notes, yada, 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 people. Um, anything that you can store in your computer, essentially, you can associate with a given activity. We also have an add-on for this that watches what you do. It keeps it on your machine. It's not a Big Brother thing where we watch what you do, but your, your device watches what you do. And if you happen to visit a website more than once in that activity, or if you look at a certain document on your, on your device more than once in that activity, it'll say, hey, do you want me to associate that with this activity for you? And associating things with activity is quite simple. Here we are looking at a website in the web browser, which of course is fully touch-driven, you know, pinch, zoom, yada, yada. 
in the top right, there's our share, like, and connect buttons. And you can like things, which basically creates a bookmark or an association. But you can also connect them. And when you say, I want to connect to an activity, it gives you options. So here are the options we saw earlier in the carousel, the activity uh, chooser. Uh, introduction, my first activity, vacation planning, or you just say to the current activity. So as soon as I touch one of those options, when I switch to the introduction activity, it will show this website. When I switch to another activity, it's gone. It's away from me. So it allows me to focus very clearly on what I'm doing. This turns one device into six or seven in terms of focus and purpose. This is absolutely terrific for uh, people who work in project-oriented uh, businesses, engineering or advertisement. It works great in school systems, we found, in classrooms with multiple class uh, topics, or people like me who just have lots of things that they're juggling in their life. So that is what we, we created. And keep in mind that this UI, fully touch-driven, has about 5%, well, less than 5% uh, delta in terms of lines of code from the desktop UI. And just to kind of make it bleedingly obvious, if you extrapolate from the desktop UI to this, and then think about some other form factor, or some other way of presenting a user experience, and consider the small delta to get to here, you can do pretty much anything you'd like with this framework. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about what our uh, driving principles are in creating this, this framework. By the way, if anyone has questions or thoughts, whatever, feel free to interrupt me as we go. I know it's supposed to be questions at the end, but I hate just yakking at people. If you have a burning question, just put up your hand and we'll, we'll deal with it right away. Yes? I actually just wanted to make her run up and down the stairs because I'm evil like that. Uh, yeah, just had a real quick question about the activities. Yes. Um, like, how natural a fit is that to kind of people's models of, you know, how they think about the world? Yeah. Is it, because I'm kind of like, I, I'm definitely like that. I'm juggling lots of things, and it's good to switch between them. But are we, like, in a niche minority, or is, that, is it something that most people generally get how many quite quickly? How many people go to school? Most people. Every single one of them have multiple classes that they're juggling. How many people work in a work environment where they have more than one task over the course of a year? Mm. Most of them. And what we find is when we put this model in front of people in those situations, they get it right away. So all of this, I should also provide some input. We'll probably get to this in a bit. But everything that we do in the UI and the UX side is uh, usability tested. And that isn't with like our geek friends. Um, we actually have you know regular normal Joe people that we inflict our work in progress software on and our ideas and actually work through and figure out what is working and what isn't working. And we actually have a continual list of things that aren't working, because that never ends, uh, especially since we add new features and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, we, we didn't design this in a vacuum. Um, and it, the idea of activities maps pretty cleanly. We can find people for which activities are meaningless, in which case they ignore them and use it as an application bucket. You can still launch activities and whatnot, or, or applications, add, um, add applications. So the bar at the top, which is kind of another neat little tidbit um, to augment activities, one of the things that we didn't like about iOS or Android is that they bury everything in like a maze of options. You have to click five times with your, or press five times with your, your finger to get anywhere. Virtually the entire UI can be driven with one swipe anywhere you are. So if you pull down on the top bar, which is always available, you actually see all your applications, both the running ones in a live uh, strip, as well as all the ones that you can launch up above that. You can also do searches in the, uh, in the uh, search and launch area at the top. So no matter where you are, you can just pull it down, switch between, acti uh, between applications, or go back to the home screen, or launch applications. Um, so if you want, you can treat it like an application bucket. But we find that most people actually do more than one thing in their life. We've also identified the fact that a lot of people, especially in the world of bring your own device, use a device at home, but then cart it into the office or the school uh, that, they, that they're uh, currently attending. And so most people's devices actually live multiple lives anyways. 
And when we watched people try and force their iOS or Android devices into this model, it really was a forcing, and they don't really map that well. So, yeah. but good question. Thank you. Yep. So what are our guiding principles? And I think that these principles really extend beyond what we're doing and are applicable. We, I would love to see more free software projects think in these ways, maybe not exactly like this, but in, with these ideas in mind. So first and foremost, elegance. We really wanted to create things that people looked at and went, ah, oh, I want that. That looks nice, that works well, that's something I want. We want to create not just good experiences for the user, but amazing ones. We want to think about the person who is using it first, and then us second. We feel that a lot of the current mobile stacks are really thinking about how can we sell apps, which is fine, business model, great. But the people using it really come second to all of that, and we want to reverse that. And finally, we wanted an efficient development framework. And this is for a couple of reasons. Number one, if we're going to give people an alternative to Target, they're probably not going to want to invest a lot of time in at least trying it out. So they have to get results quickly. The other side of it is that as a new framework, and especially one with its roots in the open source or free software community, we don't have 1,000 people working on it. We need our own framework to be efficient so we can support a desktop, a netbook, a media center, a tablet, and whatever else we add to it in future. So an efficient development framework was really important for us. These are three different ways of applying that word elegance, but I think that they're equally applicable depending on which facet you're looking at. I already talked quite a bit about device spectrum, but just to delve into that a little bit deeper, uh, we wanted the ability to write once and deploy it everywhere. And we'll look a bit uh, in a moment about how we achieve that. We want users to be able to move from one device to another seamlessly. And that's given by having a unified framework that actually travels from device to device. They can take their experience with them. So for instance, if you create activities on your, uh, lap or your, your tablet, then you connect a Bluetooth keyboard to it and say, oh, I'm going to switch to the desktop interface. All your activities are still there in the desktop UI. So you're no longer de choosing, do I want mobility or do I want you know, desktop? That's, we think, a, a false choice. It's really about what is your information, what's your data, and what are your tasks. And most importantly, we also realize that we have limited vision. We don't know what tomorrow's devices are going to be. Well, we might maybe tomorrow's devices, but the day after that. There will be new things that we can't see coming, and we want this software to be able to travel with the imaginations of those who are creating great new things. And these first two principles required us to adopt a third principle, which is that of componentization. We wanted a very high level of reuse between any two projects. Again, this goes back to the efficiency, but also the ability to transition from device to device with a common experience. We wanted to make it easy to remove or add any given part. This allows us to offer what we call differentiation without incompatibility, which is just a really weird way of saying, if you want your device to look one way as a vendor, and you want it to look a different way as a vendor, you can do this, have it look differently, maybe behave a little bit differently, without having to sacrifice compatibility. This is a problem that a lot of other platforms have had. Apple solves this by not letting anyone differentiate, because they're doing it themselves, and Android just kind of tries to herd cats, or Google does. But we wanted to allow people to differentiate without creating incompatibility. And again, fast development, quality results. So what does this componentization lead to? What's interesting is, so I mentioned earlier that we use the same battery indicator, the same network indicator. Every individual component that you saw on those screenshots devolves into a single component. All those components tend to be broken behind the scenes into a visual presentation and a business logic back end. Uh, this sounds basic, right? Well, of course, why wouldn't you do it that way? Until you start looking at most software out there for uh, at least uh, GUIs, and you realize it's just this, usually this mess of things hardwired together. What this means is that we can take the same UI piece, such as the network indicator, we can put it on top of an operating system that has a completely different networking stack than another, and we don't touch the UI. Or we can go, we hate that UI, we don't like the way that networking is presented, and we can change just the way networking is presented to the user without changing the back end and how it actually works at the operating system level or changing any of the other components. 
So you can pick and choose exactly what you wish to change and what you don't wish to change. And without having to re-engineer everything or sort out a bunch of spaghetti code, achieve your, your, um, your targets. So those are some of the technical goals that we had. We also had social goals. Um, I find that there are a lot of people who look at technology and see it as a math problem. If we just figure out the right numbers to put in, it'll all work out. And then technology isn't a math problem. Uh, it is in part, but it's also a social problem or challenge. It's not a problem. One of the things we wanted to achieve was an open ecosystem. We want to be able to encourage a large community of contributors as well as users. And this has real implications for how you manage everything in, this, in, your, in your stack. We wanted to achieve a collaboration of companies. So while we have this one Plasma Active tablet UI, there's actually quite a number of companies. We have a partner network that I help manage. We have 13 companies in that. And we've had other companies that have also been contributing in their own way. All the planning, however, is done in the open. Just because you have corporate involvement doesn't mean you have to close down, take everything behind closed doors. We tend to do everything in the open. Sometimes that's slightly painful, but we feel it, it benefits it, uh, both ourselves as well as the technology in the long run. And of course, we follow an open source development model. People often talk about open source in terms of licensing. I like to think of that as free software, as in freedom. And when I talk about open source, I mean a methodology of openly developing where people can participate. All of those things we talked about earlier that Android or iOS really are not delivering on in terms of openness, we want to be able to do that, and I think we've achieved that. And finally, we want to be able to create and foster the, the creation of open markets. It's not only enough to be able to participate, we also need to be able to participate in the markets that may emerge around it. So we've done this in a number of ways. First off, we're operating system agnostic. Most of our work is done targeting and operating or with a Linux-based operating system called MER, which is the community continuation of Migo, if you follow that stuff. But we have targeted, uh, we do run our stack on top of Debian, OpenSUSE, and there's no real reason it can't be poured to any Unix-like OS. We're hardware agnostic. So this tablet here, this big clunky thing, which I basically just keep around for development because it's really simple, is Intel-based. Great. This one, surprisingly eno uh, enough, is not Intel-based. This is an ARM device, and it runs just as well on this device as it does here. We have a build server where we can upload packages and say, please build me a package for the platform. And it will build it for Intel and a number of ARM architectures as well. We don't really care what hardware you run it on. And that's important as well. We're open for third-party applications. And I think really interestingly enough, we have an open, which means free software as well as you can actually host it yourself if you wish, apps and content store. We developed that other piece of the puzzle, which is how do you deliver add-on applications, artwork, eBooks, music, etc. And that is also entirely free software. And none of the kind where we developed it, made it really hard for you to use, and then chucked it over the fence without any documentation. It's well documented. You can set it up on your machine, the server side especially, in a matter of minutes if you have a, a reasonably decent Linux uh, OS with you that has things like Redis and Node.js and PostgreSQL. Um, you can literally set up in minutes, and away you go. This was also key for us because without that part of it, you have an OS, but a closed market. And finally, we don't have any royalties attached to it, no real gimmicks. We're trying to create something open and free. We would love to see a world where there are fewer walled gardens and more community where instead of us trying to say, this is how you're going to interact with our mobile platform, you say, here's how I'm going to interact with this mobile platform that you've helped create. So at this point, I usually do um, the uh, uh, demo, but it's a little awkward to do in this environment. I've only got 10 minutes left. So uh, I will skip over that for now. Um, where are we going from here? I think it's really important to know that this isn't just a project we worked on and it's done, but 
we also have a destination in mind from here. So some of the things we're working on right now, it's performance. Um, right now it works very smoothly on, I've got, this is a one gigahertz Intel Atom, quite old actually. This is a one gigahertz uh, A8. This is a dual core A7. It runs very, very nicely on all these different devices. Um, minimum half gig of RAM, we usually recommend a gig of RAM. But where we're working on performance is hardware accelerated rendering of everything. Uh, how many people here follow the Linux graphics stack wanderings? Somewhat. How many of you have heard of Wayland? Some of you. Okay. How many of you have heard of X or Xorg? So X11 or Xorg is the way that on Linux we usually throw windows up on the screen. Uh, it's a great technology, but it was designed really at the original time for, well, in a time when we didn't know what desktops were going to be, let alone mobile devices. And it was designed for the way we used machines in the past. This is, X11 was designed before GPUs, just to put into some perspective. <laughs> Wayland is the successor, or we expect to be the successor of Xorg. The people who uh, maintain X11 and Xorg today are working on Wayland. And what Wayland is, it's a modern windowing system uh, that allows us to hardware accelerate absolutely every pixel on screen with every frame being perfect. And to do so in very, uh, with very limited resource requirements. It's really well suited for uh, ARM devices with even reasonable OpenGLS support on the GPU. We're also moving to, so uh, who here has worked with Qt or Qt? Or knows that yet? Yeah. Are you waving at me or just no? Uh, yeah. How many people here have worked with GDK? OK, so all right. Um, what graphics toolkit have you used? Any? Besides Qt or GDK? MFC on Windows or .NET or these things? Java? There's a lot of silence out there. Um, OK, so Qt is a, uh, a framework for a, a set of libraries for building um, graphical applications. One of the really neat things about it is it allows us to create entire UIs in a declarative language. So traditionally, for the software developers who raised their hand earlier, usually when you create a UI, you do it imperatively. You say, I want to put a button here, and I'm going to put this button in a layout or some sort of uh, geometry manager. And when the person clicks on this button, I want you to then run this little callback over here. And you kind of tell, you know, build a model in your code of, of the UI. Declarative UIs do it completely differently. Um, it's actually, if you've used EFL from Enlightenment or even Flash Script to some extent, this is more declarative. And what you do is you, def you declare what your UI is and how it fits together. So instead of saying, I want to make a new button, you say, here's a button. By the way, it has these properties. And you can bind any two properties together, and they automatically uh, uh, it, the connections are made automatically and they, they interact with each other. So for instance, uh, the text that's shown on a button in a declarative language usually say set text or whatever the equivalent is. Mm -hmm. In a declarative language, you say the text of this button will always be, and then you give it a property that exists somewhere else, user input, or maybe it follows the same text that you see over here. And then the framework actually builds and constructs the UI on your behalf. So it looks something like this. So in this case, we have an image uh, item at the root level. We have an ID. You have some properties. You have data sources, which are data models. This is the business logic side. Uh, there's a metadata model here, which is basically grabbing metadata from files on the, on the system. And then to show it, let me scroll down a little bit here. So you have functions. If you think this looks like JavaScript, you'd be right, because it's actually um, a JavaScript derivative, and you can actually use JavaScript inside of it. So here is how we actually show the UI. We create a page stack. We anchor it to different parts of the UI. Uh, and that's actually it. 
So page stack is, is a component that's declared elsewhere, and it has um, a property called toolbar, for instance. We're telling it, use this other component called toolbar, and it automatically brings these together. If we change what toolbar is, the toolbar in the page stack automatically changes. So instead of building complex uh, state machines in line-by-line -line code, you define what your UI looks like and how it works, and the system puts it together. One of the really cool things about this approach is it allows us to create a scene graph. Has anyone done great games development? Okay. Uh, um, so in a game, you tend not to uh, you know, paint the full screen every time. What you tend to have is you have a scene graph where you have different textures, different images, different parts of the scene. And you update part nodes of the scene, and then you say, okay, please render that to the screen for me. And this allows all the rendering, or at least the vast majority of it, to be put onto the GPU on the one hand. On the other hand, it also allows the game engine to schedule when to draw what. And this turns out to be the perfect way to ensure that your, uh, whatever you're putting on screen is maximally uh, run on the, on the GPU or whatever you have for, for graphics hardware. So in the performance bullet point, we're actually uh, have moved from QML1, Q, it's the Qt meta language, uh, which is this declarative language you just saw, to QML2. And QML2 is actually fully scene graph based and runs completely on the, on the GPU. What's really neat, if you're into OpenGL programming, is you can uh, throw uh, shaders directly into your QML as if it's JavaScript and animate or do any sort of OpenGL you know, particle or vertex shading or what have you um, on the fly and it gets rendered on the GPU. It's like writing OpenGL, except it doesn't make you poke your eyes out. At least that's my opinion of it. Um, if you want to see something really neat, go to YouTube and search for Raspberry Pi QML and you'll see some insane video showing it on the Raspberry Pi, which is not a very powerful machine, transforming video in some really neat ways on the fly. The guy's actually typing the QML um, on the Raspberry Pi that it's rendering, and the video is behind his code, rendering and showing the changes he's doing live. It's mind-blowing. Uh, we're also looking to divine, define new device targets. So one that we picked up recently was Media Center, and we're looking for new ideas as well. And so we're doing some research on that side. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I skipped over pre-installed devices. One of the things that we feel is that unless you can buy a device with it on it, very few people will buy a device and then flash it with something random. Uh, it's fairly difficult to do, and there's no way of reaching the consumer market this way. So for the last year, uh, I and my company and various people that are working with us uh, have been working on a tablet device from the ground up that we can support, have a roadmap, all GPL sources right now, except for the GPU driver, which we're currently reverse engineering, but that won't be ready for the first release. Um, yeah, and well supported. When you open the box, it'll have Plasma Active on it, complete with your usual two-year warranty, etc. And we're looking for more opportunities to do that with other kinds of devices as well. We're also, in the next six months, going to be introducing the content store to independent authors. One of the weird out flows of this is we found out about people like independent authors who are getting royally screwed by Amazon. If they want to sell a book for 2 or $3, they make like 30 cents, which is insane, especially since independent authors tend to do all their own promotion. And when one independent author in Canada, randomly, it wasn't because I come from there, uh, saw what we were doing, he said, hey, could we use that? Could I put that on my website? Could I upload my, my ebook content and then sell it on my website and keep all the profit? And he said, yeah, sure, of course, why not? And so this is actually happening. We're rolling out a pilot project with a series of, or a group of independent authors in North America right now who will be using the content store that we developed for the mobile side to actually be able to promote and sell their own content. As a neat aside, when they upload their content to the content store, it'll also become available to anyone who's accessing the add-on store in Plasma Active or on Plasma Desktop. So that's where we're going. Are there opportunities for anyone else? Or is this just our playground? And I hope I've emphasized enough that we're trying to create an open, inclusive world that isn't just for us. So yes, there's a lot of opportunities.
application developers. There's people working on all sorts of applications from mapping to games to educational applications. Uh, classroom management is one that's happening right now. We're looking for hardware developers. Um, or if you're a hardware developer that just wants to scratch your itch and play with cool hardware like this, it's a great opportunity. We're always looking for new um, and driven designers. There's so much more to try to, if you just say what we know as mobile, it doesn't have to be that way. There are so many possibilities when it comes to design. Um, we've really explored a lot about activities. That's certainly not the only idea out there. And of course, we're looking for other entrepreneurial companies. We work with companies that focus on things as diverse as groupware, to office suite software, to companies like us that are producing hardware. So there's lots of opportunities, and we're looking for more people like us who believe that the world needs free software for the mobile world, or maybe just mobile software that is in an application bucket. So that's generally the 50,000 foot at 100 miles per hour overview of what we're doing. Um, there's some IRC channels, there's a website up there, there's some email uh, lists, active at kd.org, plasmadevel, kd.org. Um, there's our wiki, it's all up there and open. And of course, you can harass me as well um, by email or on IRC, um, you wouldn't be the first. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and if we have any questions, we have time for questions? Yep, we've got- Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. If Yay. anyone's got a question, just wanna raise your hand. Anyone at all? I did an amazing job. <laughs> I answered everyone's questions preemptively. Here we go. No. Hi, Ion. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I know that you work in KDE with Plasma, but what is the difference of the advantages uh, with KDE against a GNOME or other Linux desktop or Linux Windows interface? So. One thing I try not to do, because I don't think it's very productive, is get into a um, comparison or you know, a pissing match, so to speak, between free software projects. Um, I actually see uh, projects and communities like GNOME as having a lot to contribute, and they have contributed a lot to the free software desktop. Um, that said, I think where our unique perspective comes from is we in, within KDE, we have a very clear focus on community, making sure that it's open to companies, researchers, and individuals who just want to write software because it's awesome and cool. Um, on the research side, we just wrapped up a e another EU project. I think this is our fourth EU-funded project, research project that we actually do in, in cooperation with universities and, and uh, professional researchers. So we try and blend that. I think that's fairly unique in what we do. The other side is we do have this focus on great software that runs everywhere. So for the applications, now within KDE we create these desktop environments, tablets, etc. We also create things like Krita Sketch, which is probably one of the best natural media drawing applications you'll find on any platform, closed or open. Um, it's actually starting to be used by movie studios and video uh, producers to do touch-ups on, on video along with tools such as Blender and whatnot. Uh, those applications run on Windows, Many of them run on Mac OS, as well as pretty much every Linux and BSD you can throw at it. So the applications run everywhere, and that's very important to us. And they look native where they run. You run on Windows, you open up a, a file dialog, you get the Windows file dialog in all of its horror. Um, if you run it on a GNOME desktop, for instance, you get, uh, if you have the right, uh, if your OS has configured it correctly, you'll actually get things like the GNOME uh, file dialog. We really believe in integration. For the, what we call the workspaces, Plasma workspaces, we have this very unique focus in the free software world on this device spectrum idea. We're not the only ones to have it ever, but we're the only ones to actually execute on it. We're the only ones right now where we can actually show and have been showing for a few years. Here's the same code base running on a desktop, a tablet. Um, we actually did our first phone call on a phone. Um, we had a, a phone prototype UI in 2010. Um, so we've been doing this for a while, um, and we think that's a very unique uh, accomplishment in the free software world. Well, I actually don't know of any other uh, project that's been able to do that. Um, and we think this is just the beginning, right? We don't think we're done. Uh, I, you know, we see smartwatches coming out right now. I'm not a big believer in them, but maybe that's because I lack imagination. Uh, but who knows what's coming next? And that whole device spectrum concept is pretty unique, um, we feel.
So. Sure, I think we've got time for one more question, if anyone else has one. So you mentioned you've had this running on a phone in 2010, and earlier on you also said all your drivers are open. Does that mean you've got an open radio and baseband driver for cellular networks knocking around somewhere? Yeah, I wish. Oh. No. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh. So uh, the device we're coming out with right now is a tablet, not a phone. Partially because of this problem. Um, we are working to find ways to do what others like OpenMoco tried and didn't really get to, but we see that as a longer term thing. The phone market is really hard to get into. There's regulatory issues around the hardware, there's carrier annoyances that just do nothing but make trouble, uh, and you have a very saturated, highly competitive market that makes the tablet market look tame. So we're looking at, at, at uh, applications such as tablet, media center, things where we see possibilities for entering the market. And as we grow that, and that becomes a foundational base along with desktop, et cetera, then we're going to move to phone. And these are exactly the kinds of problems that we're looking to, to resolve. So wish us luck, but also get involved. Because uh, the more people get involved, the, the faster it will happen. Sorry? I said will do and good luck. Cheers. And again, thank you very much for your attention and your loving patience in the afternoon. Okay, um, let's give um, Aaron Saigo a round of applause. Thank you very much, Aaron. Cheers. And next up, our very last talk on the Archimedes stage of the week, we have John Maddo-Cole. Um, so if you want to join us, stick around. Thank you.